All right, we are on page 33 of our book. <clears throat> if you need a, if you don't have a book and you'd like to follow along, there are books on the back table in the back. Uh, abstain from uh, every form of evil. We are finishing up, or actually on to our questions on the problem of drink, which is lesson six. The final uh, statement at the end of this lesson was drinking alcohol is dangerous to the body and society as well as being sinful. We pray that each of us, when confronted by the problem of drinking, will determine by the help of God to chart that course which will not bring reproach upon the body of Christ, ourselves, and our families. So question one, definition, wine. Yeah. yeah, grape juice in varying states. Uh, it was mixed with water as a normal drink. Uh, and as we studied, uh, there, were, there were ways to prevent fermentation or at least slow it down. And just because something is beginning to ferment does not mean it's alcoholic. There is a difference between fermentation and alcoholic. Uh, and of course, even Peter acknowledged that even, even with the, the old wine, if you will, that was mixed with water, as Peter acknowledged in Acts chapter 2, as the Jews were claiming that the apostles were drunk, Peter says, it's only the what hour? Third hour, which by Jewish time reckoning was what time in the day? Nine o'clock, 9 a.m. So they, they, they could have been drinking their, their version of wine, the, the grape juice mixed with water for three hours, non-stop and they wouldn't have been able to drink enough to get drunk at this point point. Uh, and that's why Peter says that and so even the old wine which may have begun to ferment or even be a little bit alcoholic because it was so watered down it did not have that effect unless you tarried long at wine or what's the other kind of drink in the Old and New Testament that is never ever uh, considered good or ever approved Strong drink. It is specifically designed to be intoxicating, specifically to be, to be designed to, uh, to become drunk. <clears throat> All right, excess of wine. What does that mean? Yeah, overabundance, overflowing indulgence, which leads to drunkenness. But as we talked about today's definition of drunkenness and the New Testament's uh, definition of drunkenness are two different things. What is the New Testament's definition of drunkenness? What's, what's, the, what's the definition, what's the thought process behind being drunk? Having my judgment impaired. Okay, being, being intoxicated to the point that I am no longer sober-minded. I'm no longer, uh, I, I'm inhibited from being able to properly judge or inhibitions have been lifted that would normally prevent me from saying or doing or thinking things that I normally wouldn't. Okay, drunkenness in today's definition is falling over, can't see straight, can't talk straight. That's not the New Testament's definition. So anytime somebody says, well, as long as you don't get drunk, well, they're using today's definition, not the New Testament's definition. Revelings. Yeah. Yeah, binds. Yeah, it says let, it's literally letting loose. It's a consequence of being intoxicated. Revelings is the lowering of inhibitions. It's like a... Uh, it's, it's what results from not having that proper judgment. Uh, and usually it is with other people, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. It is not exclusive to uh, reveling with groups of people. That's usually how we find it, but it's not limited to that. Yeah, kind of, yeah, let loose, yep, yep. All right, what about banquetings? Yeah, yeah some, some translations have drinking parties. King James, I think, says banquetings. Uh, some people automatically equate this to social drinking. They're not the same thing. Okay, banquetings, these were 
basically literally drinking parties, parties where people would go and they would drink. Now, social drinking, the way we define it, isn't limited to a party. That doesn't mean that social drinking is okay. Okay, that goes back to having, uh, well, not only to do with not letting others' influence affect us, but also going back to the intoxication aspect of it, not letting uh, our sound mind be compromised. But banquetings, as used by Peter, is talking about literally a lively drinking party or a lively party. And that's usually why you have revelings and drinking parties. Revelings would often take place at these drinking, partings, uh, drinking parties. Uh, there's also a term carousing, uh, which is linked here as well. Some translations have that in 1 Peter chapter 4. And that, that concept of with revelings, carousing, also had a connection with these drinking parties as well. The Romans were notorious for it, and the Greeks were too. All right, anything through the definitions? All right, multiple choice. I can't, can I hide it? There we go, okay. Number one, over what, A, B, or C, persons above the age of 20 in the U.S. use alcoholic beverages, according to the study in 1978? C, 65 million. There are A, B, C, people in the U.S. who are addicted to alcohol. C, or I'm sorry, B, no, it's 3 million. Uh, three. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. No, it's I'm sure it's probably even more than that. Uh, three alcoholics in this nation are increasing at the rate of what a year? C 50,000. Number four, the habit of drinking is one that begins with what, what type of people? Yeah, young people. It, it, certainly that's not exclusive, but I, I guess you could say probably the majority. That's probably where it starts. Uh, number five, alcohol is a narcotic that removes what? Inhibitions, I thought that was funny, stains. I guess you could use it to remove stains. Alcohol can remove stains, I guess. Uh, but yeah, inhibitions. Um, and of course, we talked about the term narcotic. There's two ways in which narcotic is used in today's society. One is opioids, which are literally narcotics. The other is the actual definition of the term narc, which means to sleep, otic, which means to come to the state of. So the state of going to sleep or the state of being in a stupor and that's how alcohol is being used here as a narcotic. Number six, drinking a cocktail requires a driver to have what more feet to stop a car than he would have needed before drinking or without drinking? C6. Number seven, ancient people had what of preserving the juice of the grape without fermentation? Yeah, I put B, uh, different ways, either to stop it or to at least slow it down. Uh, certainly, they didn't have refrigeration, which is what we have today to be able to certainly keep that from happening. Uh, and under normal circumstances, certainly grape juice will begin to ferment if left out uh, by the yeast by, uh, of the, the, the uh, skin of the grape. Uh, but again, fermentation and turning into alcohol are two different things. Okay, this, just because it's starting to ferment doesn't mean it's yet alcoholic. It's not the same thing. Anything through multiple choice? All right. Uh, oh, wait. No, we have number eight and number nine. Sorry. As a Christian, I should be concerned about my influence on? Yeah, A, B, and C. All people, including weak Christians and strong Christians. Number nine, the potential for becoming an alcoholic comes with what? Yeah, the first drink. Yeah, the, the first drink is what can, can grab people, especially younger people. Uh, you know, some people claim they don't like how it makes them feel, and yet they're always drinking with others. So whether it's uh, because they actually do, and they're just either lying to themselves or others, or they want to fit in with others, are either of those acceptable reasons to drink? Because I want to fit in with other people? Is that an acceptable reason to do something? No. no. All right, what's wrong with these statements? Television and magazine ads give an accurate and honest impression of drinking. So they're always going to present an idealized version of what that looks like. We talked a little bit about how it's kind of presented on things like, like shows like Frasier, how it's kind of the, the sophistication. You know, Frasier's drink of choice was sherry. Uh, you know, it was always kind of the sophisticated men and people of intelligence and things like that. And that's kind of the, the draw to it. 
that sometimes that they have on it. And some of these, some of these ads are the same way, uh, kind of going at it from a sophistication perspective, people with higher taste, and that's just inaccurate. Number two, alcohol doesn't harm me. I can control my liquor. I don't get drunk. What have we, what have we talked about after one can of beer, one glass of wine, one shot of, of alcohol? What happens? You are automatically, even if you don't feel it, your blood alcohol level gets to that 0.02%. And it's, it's defined uh, by the, the, the alcohol percentage defines that as uh, lowered inhibitions, 0 0.02. That's one can of beer, one glass of wine, one shot of alcohol. Uh, so first of all, no, that's, that's not entirely true. You may think you, it doesn't harm you or you can control uh, your liquor. And maybe there are some people with varying degrees of success of being able to present themselves as not drunk, also known as being able to hold your liquor, but that doesn't mean that your, uh, your, uh, your mind, your, your sound judgment isn't impaired. Uh, and then the question of, I don't get drunk, well, how do you know? Okay, how do you know? Where's the line? And again, that goes back to the New Testament definition versus today's definition. If we're using today's definition, which most people do, in fact, I haven't heard anyone who would argue, even Christians who argue that it's okay to drink, they always use today's definition of drunk. Just like they use the same equivalence of the New Testament version of alcohol or wine versus today's version. Even, yet, even their version, the Old Testament, New Testament version of strong drink is nothing compared to what we have today. Okay, we have artificial means that they didn't have to be able to enrich or say enrich to uh, increase the alcoholic content of their uh, of our drinks we have that ability they didn't uh, so they could only really get so much before they had diminishing returns we're able to do far more than that and so it's a false equivalency to to make those parallels anything else through number two Number three, it's no one's business but mine if I drink. And this is usually associated with, well, as long as I drink at home and nobody's with me and, you know, uh, even in the case of, well, I, you know, I don't have a spouse to influence or kids or whatever, I'm all by myself. Huh? God still knows. And do I have to be around others for my judgment to be impaired? Can I do, is sin committed exclusively in the presence of others? No, no. Any time that my, my, in my uh, judgment is impaired, my ability to determine right and wrong is impaired, whether I'm with others or not, that brings about not only stronger temptation, but it usually brings about sin as well. And so certainly that is not a, uh, that is not a uh, sound argument. And then, of course, there's those who make the argument, and they do have people that can be influenced, and certainly that's a problem uh, in and of itself. Anything through number three? Well, I'm just with my good friend. They, they know me, yeah. Then it just goes on. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Gilbert? Yeah. Whether uh, I've had people try and justify <laughs> cooking sherry on mm -hmm. their counter, it says abstain. Yeah. It doesn't matter where you are, and even, even if you, for whatever reason, maybe your grandma used cooking sherry. I, I get all that, but you're still supporting the industry, and you're not abstaining. And to me, this is the verse that solves all of those problems. Abstain means none. Yeah. Anything else through number three? Yes, ma'am. Well, if you're impaired, regardless of whether you're by yourself or with others, how are you going to make a defense for God's truth? Yeah. And the other thought I had was everybody's got something they deal with, right? So if it removes the inhibition and I'm just going to grab something out of there and you like pornography, what are you more likely? Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, and you know, a lot of times alcoholics, they, or well, I say alcoholics, people who drink alcohol often are, uh, you have diff- different varying degrees of people who, how they're affected by alcohol. Sometimes they become very emotional, you know, and they may think or do things uh, towards family members that they ordinarily wouldn't think or do or say. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of ways in which you you open yourself up needlessly, I might add, to temptation where temptation's already around us all the time anyway. Okay, why open up chinks in your armor specifically for the devil to shoot through if you don't need to do that? And, you know, we already have, uh, you know, hard enough time as it is without creating additional areas for the devil to try to get to us. Anything else through number three? All right, number four, Jesus turned water into wine, so it must be okay to drink it. This is a common, common argument. First of all, in the example of the wedding at Cana, Jesus turned water into wine, and then what did the master of the party say about the wine they were bringing in? Do you remember? What? It was the best. It, he called it the new wine. Normally, they bring in the bad stuff, the old stuff, and then they bring in the new stuff. See, the, the newer wine, which would be not, not alcoholic, okay, or at the very least extremely diluted, that was, that was what was valued, not the older stuff. Okay, the older stuff, which would have had the potential to be more fermented, that's the stuff that you normally have first and then get rid of it so that you can have the new stuff. They valued the new stuff. That's the first problem with that. Second problem with that is, Did Jesus turn it into strong drink, which would be at least close to the equivalent of what we have today? No, he didn't. He turned it into wine, which would have been the diluted version of what they drank. And so, no, that is not the same thing as today's wine, and it's a false equivalency to use that passage to try to justify drinking. Yes, ma'am. I believe it's the other way around. Yeah. They would drink the old wine first to get it out of the way. The new wine would come in, but they didn't do that. They brought the new wine that Jesus had made into the wedding party. I believe is how that, how that worked. All right. Anything else through number four? All right, number five, deacons are not to be given to much wine, so they can be given to a little bit. And I think that's the focus here. It's not about, well, so are there different rules for elders and deacons where they're not allowed to have as much wine as the regular brethren? Okay, no, there's not, there's not differentiating rules here. Okay, what we're talking about is not allowing, and, and, and this would have been true for anybody, okay, but especially not allowing things to uh, influence your judgment, to impair your ability, first of all for elders especially, to impair their judgment, but deacons as well uh, in their works that they're doing. Even wine of the day had the potential to intoxicate if too much was consumed, and that was true for everyone. I mean, Peter brings that up in Acts chapter 2. And so it's important to note that certain, certain kinds could, if you tarried long at it, if you drank all day long, then maybe you could get to that point. But that's not what the Christian's supposed to do, and certainly not what deacons are supposed to do, or elders for that matter. Anything through number five? Number six, Paul told Timothy it was okay to use a little wine, so it's okay to drink a little as long as I don't get drunk. First of all, is that what Paul said? Okay. He said, so as a medicinal purpose, take a little for your stomach's sake. Okay, and certainly 
you know, we talk about things for medicinal purposes within reason to make sure that, that you know, we keep it within that reason. But even then, <laughs> does that mean that as long as I don't get drunk by, by again, that goes back to the, today's definition versus their definition. And again, it, it's that false equivalency that people deliberate. I, I tend to think sometimes they deliberately do it because surely they have to know better. But then some people actually don't know better. Uh, but the fact is, yes, Paul did tell Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach's sake because a little wine was fine. In fact, wine that they drank to drink, again, was one part wine to three parts water. And it purified the water. It gave them clean water to drink, and that was perfectly fine. But in the case of um, the uh, even the stronger drink or even the... Um, I guess you could say richer drink, even then you had to be very, very careful. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah. That's what Jesus created. He, he made the new wine. Normally they put out the old stuff first and then drink that until it's all gone. But instead they, instead they brought out what Jesus had made. Isn't that what he's talking about? What Jesus made? Yeah. Yeah. That, that term, the, the term... He says the good wine I know. Well, well, that may be. That may be that it's, they serve the good wine and the bad wine to get rid of the rest of it. That could be. I might have had that order reversed. Yeah, it could be. But right. But what the, the 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 what it means is that the the bad stuff or the old stuff was the bad stuff. That was not the stuff that they wanted to drink. That was the worst stuff. They wanted the good stuff, which was the new one, which would have been far less they fermented. They had already, yeah, that, that would have been the usual situation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, th thanks for correcting that. I appreciate it. All right, anything else through? <laughs> All right, anything else through number six? All right. Anything else through the lesson on drinking? Yeah. Our influence, and you know, if I if I want a coke, I have to go in a liquor store to get a coke. You know, like I see people see me coming out of a liquor store, or I'm in the grocery store and have a bottle of wine in my basket, and somebody that I might have talked to about the gospel and trying to get them to understand what the New Testament tells us how we're supposed to live, and they see that in my basket, you know, an alcohol. Mm -hmm. then we all know that we've lost that, that influence on that person. And to me, that's the biggest thing. Are, are we really under the conviction not to drink or be around any kind of alcohol to, to help somebody get to heaven? Yeah. Although I said all that, all that's making sense, but mm -hmm. that's, that's my biggest thing is our influence around other people. Yeah. Good point. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, there was a time in my life where I attended a lot of conferences that had social hours and stuff like that. And, you know, as Gilbert said, you know, going to the spirit of the people, I usually didn't go to them. But if I did, I didn't even get water because I wanted the people around me to know I wasn't drinking. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, what's the trick there? Stay away from the pigs. <laughs> huh? Or have clean pins. There you go. See, now Dwayne has clean pins, though, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. All right. Uh, so, uh, anything else through our, our lesson there? All right. Let's move on to lesson seven smoking. Now, we're not going to read a whole lot of this. Again, there's a lot of statistics in this that are obviously would be outdated. I'm sure the trends are still valid and, and uh, uh, relative, but, uh, or uh, uh, relate, relate to the trends. But uh, there's a couple things I do want to, to bring out here. Uh, smoking one package or more, 20 cigarettes a day, will shorten one's life on the average by 12 years. Uh, he goes through and talks about the dangers, the physical aspects of what can happen to the body and so forth regarding smoking. And of course, this is smoking cigarettes. And of course, that's really not in vogue anymore all that much anyway. Today, what's the substitute for smoking? Vaping. Yeah, it's not really any different. But because it's steam, it's supposed to be better for you and it's, and it's not. But in about you know, 10 or 15 years, they'll come out with a Surgeon General's warning for vaping as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, what was really insidious is the fact that they had different flavors there for a while. Of course, they've been banned now, which is good, but a lot of kids were using it because it, it tasted good, I guess. I don't, I don't know how the flavor works exactly, but apparently it tasted good or something. And it's, uh, it's almost like, I mean, you wouldn't flavor cigarettes. I don't even know if you can flavor cigarettes, but uh that would be the same difference it's exactly the same it, you can flavor it all you want to doesn't make it any better the christian should understand that not only can his smoking affect his health and cause early death but it affects his children and those with whom he associates children whose parents do not smoke have only a 15 percent smoking rate but among children whose parents do smoke 85 percent also smoke so not only do smoking Christians endanger their own bodies and souls, but affect and influence others as well. I thought that was a really interesting, and of course this was, again, this is around in the late 70s, 78, 79, somewhere around there. But I thought that was an interesting statistic showing the relation between kids, as impressionable as they are, if they're growing up in a home that doesn't smoke. And I'm assuming that those whose parents don't smoke, they, I imagine a lot of them are probably ardently not smoking. Uh, making a very clear point, it's bad for you, so the kids knew that it was bad for you. I don't want to do that, uh, but I think that's a really interesting statistic there. And that goes back to what, what Terry and Gilbert said about abstaining from things, uh, from these appearance of evil and the influence we can have on others. Any thoughts through that part? Again, a lot of this is, is more statistics, more information about what it can do to your body and so forth, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. That's, again, why we have the books. Anyone who thinks cigarette smoking is not harmful and hazardous to one's health cannot read the label on the package and cannot read the volumes of published material that are available. How many rational, normal people would continue to eat cranberry sauce or tuna fish or candy if the package label said, warning, consuming this material can be dangerous to your health? Yet millions go on inhaling cigarette smoke despite the warning. What would happen to the sale of tuna fish if it could be proved that one in 25 of all people who ate tuna fish would develop lung cancer? Uh, and there, while other people who live in the same area work the same jobs, they did not eat tuna fish and they didn't have nearly as much lung cancer. This is the advice of a physician and almost unanimously the advice of any physician, stop smoking while you still can. Smoking cigarettes is a lethal habit that shortens your life, harms your influence, puts you in disregard to common sense and sound advice, and puts you in direct opposition to many New Testament principles. If you do not stop for your conscience sake, please stop for your body's sake and the sake of those of our younger generation who will be encouraged to smoke or not smoke by your example. I thought that conclusion really kind of comprised everything pretty well okay doing the best we can to take care of ourselves making sure that we're putting out the the best example that we can for others uh, not disregarding common sense and sound advice uh, i think is a, another good component to that you know god expects us to be sound uh, having a sound mind having proper judgment 
uh, and certainly to use common sense. And so I think a lot of this is certainly very applicable uh, with regard to God's word as well. Anything through the, the body of the lesson of Lesson 7? Yeah. And yet they, they say, don't do it, but it's okay for us to do it because we're adults. Do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. And that's one of the, that is probably one of the biggest stumbling blocks for parents in general, but especially Christian parents. Even if we don't actually say, which no parent in the right mind should say, do as I say, not as I do, but that's the lesson that we give to our kids when we do something that we know is first of all, possibly you're sinful, for one thing, or that is uh, unsound uh, actions or words or something like that, and then we tell them not to do that. First of all, w w there's a word for that. What is that? Hypocrite. Yeah, hypocrite. And, and that even children can, can see a hypocrite. They can, they can tell the difference between somebody who practices what they, what they say they believe and say that they are, are telling other people and yet they're not doing it themselves. And as we've talked about, hypocrisy is perhaps one of, if not the biggest stumbling block often in trying to teach others is because either they're perceived, uh, the hypocrisy that they perceive in people who call themselves Christians, uh, which again is unfortunate that there are so many people who call themselves Christians who aren't, but uh, certainly with our own lives and our own example that we're trying to set. Yes, Newt? Um, so many times in the Bible, the apostles say, follow our example. Mm -hmm. They don't say, follow our rules. Yeah. They say, follow our example. We are to follow Christ's example. And we know what we need to do by his word, but his words are the example now. They go together. That's right. Well, and, and there should be a conscious decision to emulate that which is good, right? Be holy for our Father is holy. And if we're to have the same characteristics as our Father, then we're supposed to be holy like he is. You know, Paul said, Paul told Timothy, you've carefully followed my example, the things that I've taught. The, the, the list there includes not only the, the words that he spoke, but the fact that Paul backed it up by how he lived. Uh, and that's the key component there is Paul didn't set an example that was one. In fact, Paul himself made the statement in 1 Corinthians 9 about the danger of preaching to others, but I'm not disciplining myself and making sure I'm doing what's right because then I could lose my soul even if I'm helping others come to Christ. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You may not want to be a role model, but that's not the point. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody's always watching. Somebody's all, whether it's little, little kids, and it may not even be our own little kids. Could be little kids at church, could be little kids at school, could be little kids anywhere at that grocery store. Somebody's always watching, and it's, you know, certainly not exclusive to, you know, children, but, but certainly impressionable people tend to be on the younger end. That's not to say that's exclusive either but we want to try to, to set the best example we can, no matter where we are or what we're doing. From a healthcare perspective, I've had patients, several patients over the years tell me smoking is much more difficult to catch than alcohol or whatever Yeah. That is one habit. And that's one habit that does affect those around us. You know, Secondhand smoking. Yeah. We're lucky we kind of grew up in that generation of they were learning. Yeah. Even though it was all around us in the seventies, everybody smoked on planes and restaurants everywhere. Yeah. You know, we were around it. Who knows what happened to my body because <laughs> both my parents smoked and my grandparents smoked. Yeah. But we were lucky that information was becoming right. uh, more available and it's and it's not everywhere now, but it is one of those things that will hurt children. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, and uh, the fact that you've got, uh, you, know, you mentioned secondhand smoking, the fact that other people can, you can actually give other people lung cancer by your own smoking, uh, that it's, it's almost just as bad as if somebody was smoking themselves. Now, I know that there are some physiological effects for which, for, for which reason some people do smoke, but that doesn't make that, there are other ways to deal with it. For instance, I know some people, when they get stressed or their blood pressure's sky high, sometimes they smoke and it'll help them to feel de-stressed or, or lower their blood pressure. First of all, I, I think that's more of a psychological response, okay? Because they've trained their body to react that way to smoking, okay? They've become dependent on it as their means to kind of de-escalate their, their thoughts or their blood pressure or whatever. There are other means that we can, it may take a little while to teach our bodies to handle those things and cope with those things differently. But certainly just because there may be short term physical benefit of lowering my blood pressure in the moment does not justify smoking. Okay, again, that goes back to the, the, the whole thing. Well, red wine is good for your heart. Guess what? Grape juice is better for your heart. So wh why are you making that argument? You know, if you could use something that's actually better for you and doesn't include something that could actually be bad for you, including the alcohol, why are you going to defend using the alcohol? Yes, ma'am. Well, I don't know about cigarettes lowering your blood pressure, but I do know what it does. It constricts all your capillaries in small veins. Mm -hmm. And that's what it does. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you cut off part of your circulation in parts of your body. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The nicotine? Psychological. Yeah. That's kind of what I figure. Yeah. All right. Anything else through that? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a great point, especially. And, and, and I think there's some good policies that have been put into effect that whatever you, you know, debate in terms of government, you know, control and regulation. But the fact that they are so expensive, the fact that many in our society, there's no restaurants you can go to anymore that has a smoking section. Uh, you know, there's uh, in fact, most apartment complexes won't allow you to smoke, first of all, because you can't get it out of anything. You got to replace carpets and uh, drapes and stuff like that if anybody's ever smoked in, in that house and things like that. So, you know, it, it certainly there's those elements to it that have helped, I think, to, to stem the tide. But like we said, you know, vaping may not have as many obvious uh, in terms of, of having that, that uh, smell that kind of just simmers and just kind of sticks around for a long time. And I think a lot of people may associate, well, that means it's not as bad for you. But vaping is no different. All right, uh, fill in the blank. Smoking one package or more a day will shorten one's life on the average by? Yeah. Uh, some of these, number two, number three, number four, a lot of these, uh, I, I didn't highlight these. Uh, if you filled them in, that's great. I'm not gonna go through them because this is all information based on, was, how long has it been since 77? 38 years, 30, 39 years, 40 years almost. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on some of that stuff. Uh, number eight, if one stops smoking now in blank years, he has largely overcome the hazardous effects on his body. Yeah, 10 years, I think it was. Uh, now, that I think has more to do with some of the secondary aspects. Okay, if you start smoking now, does that mean necessarily that you're not gonna have lung cancer? No, no, I, I think these are some of the secondary effects that can heal, but that doesn't mean that you're immune to the primary effects of perhaps like lung cancer and things like that. Number nine, smoking cigarettes is a lethal habit that what can your life or what your life shorten your life 
blank your influence. Sorry? Harm or, yeah, harm or, or degrade. It puts you in blank to common sense and sound advice. Disregard and puts you in direct blank to many New Testament principles. Yeah, in conflict or in contradiction with. All right, anything through the fill in the blanks? Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Maybe we'll start doing that from now on to kind of in conclusion for some of these. You know, what can we do to help others with this? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, and it's important that we that we embrace our brethren because we all struggle with something and we're not all necessarily sharing that all the time with other people so we keep it very private now this is on the more unique end okay oh in the western world as opposed to uh, in other places where they openly share these types of things things that they're struggling with things that they're, they're bothered by you know that's far more open and I, I do think we can learn, you know, what does Paul say in Galatians chapter 6 about burdens? Bear one another's burdens and what? So fulfill the law of Christ. Okay? Well, part of our burdens with one another is what we struggle with. And part of bearing one another's burdens, it's not only on the brother or sister in Christ trying to help somebody bear a burden, but for me to share my burden. And, you know, not everything has to be public, but at the same time, when we're struggling with something, we can always go to our brothers or sisters, somebody we can talk to, to share and open up with, to be able to, to, to know, in addition to praying to God and talking to God about it, that I'm not alone. And there's somebody who's going to hold me accountable, somebody who's promised that they'll check in with me and make sure, see how I'm doing or whatever. You know, the more we're open with things like that, or, or at the very least recognize that, you know, we come here, we see each other three hours a day here at the building, or three hours a week, but all we see is the best of ourselves, right? We see the best of each other, generally speaking, and, and being able to understand that we are human, we all struggle with something, and to embrace one another and help each other with those things is, is very, very important. It's what the New Testament church was, was part of what it was built on. All right, everybody, thank you for uh, going with me through the study. We'll finish up here with smoking and move on next week. Thank you, everybody.